1 John 4, 13 says, this is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He has given assurance to us from his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the father has sent his son as the world's savior. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God remains in him and he in God. And we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. This is an old hymn, and the tune's a little different. Let's sing along with us this morning. Love divine, all love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down, fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unbound. Visit us with thy salvation, enter every trembling heart. Come, Almighty, to deliver, let us all thy life receive. Suddenly return and never, never more thy temples leave.
Thank you so much for your love that you've given us. God, we turn our eyes to Calvary to remember that God, you loved us first. And that God, any love that we have, any hope that we have, any eradication of fear that we have only comes from you. Lord, we love you. Thank you for what you've done for us. Help our hearts to be ready to hear your word preached today. We pray these things in your name, amen. You may be seated. If I could um, do a song this week, and he was gracious to let us do it. Um, it's a song that's been on my heart for quite a while. Um, as you know, um, I have gone to this church for a long, long time. Not as long as some of you, but for me, a really long time. And I've grown to love you, and I've grown to appreciate um, your faith. And when I was thinking about this song, and what I wanted to say, um, it reminded me that when we get to heaven, we're not going to take anything with us but Jesus. We're not going to take away who we were. We're not going to take away our position in the community or the job that we had or the money that we made or anything else. Um, and... You know, I like to think of my, when I came to Christ, when I accepted Christ, I was like, I'm not really a bad person. You know, I just wasn't doing right and I needed, I needed Jesus. But this song kind of strips all that away. As good as I thought I might've been, 
I was a filthy, rotten sinner when it came to measuring up to salvation. And when I get to heaven, it isn't going to be about me and what I did on this earth. It's going to be what Christ did for me. And that is my position right now. And that's what this song is a little bit about. So I want you to think about that. I want you to think, take on a worshipful attitude. Sing with us on the chorus. If you know it, you can sing on the verse with us. We, it's a praise song. But uh, I just want you to join us as we sing All I Have is Christ. Alleluia. All I have is Christ. Alleluia. Jesus is my. Once I was lost in darkest night, thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to Different to the cross, you look beyond my helpless state and led me to the cross, and I beheld Lord's love display. You suffered in my place, you bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I
Boy, the worship, uh, man, just over the last several weeks, it's always been good, but man, I'm telling you, the last several weeks, it has just spoken to my heart. Uh, we have a dear friend in, in Harrison, Arkansas, that might be listening today, that she would always say, uh, Dale, uh, when you find that all you have in life is Jesus, you find that's all you need. And uh, man, what a beautiful song. And uh, man, Sharon, uh, I tell you what, I want you to produce an album. I, I leaned over to the end. I said, man, just uh, both of you would together would be uh, kind of like the captain and Tennille or something. You know, it gets me, it gets me great. And uh, we need to do that. And uh, it'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> man, I appreciate you being here so much. And if you have come today as our honored guest, if you would look in front of you, and there would be a blue card. If you would take the time uh, during the preaching time to fill that card out. And then after the service, if you would, take that card with you. And, and outside the doors on the far end, there are two boxes that say offering. If you would drop that card in there, it would give us a, a wonderful privilege to know that you have come to be with us today. You know, we're honored to be here today because we've got three of our uh, sister churches, not counting other denominations that are not meeting this morning, but I, I know three of our churches in our association uh, this morning I received word that are not meeting, and so what a privilege we have this morning to be able to be here together and to worship our Lord. What a, a privilege that is uh, to be together. I just want to echo for a moment um, the the nice things that have been said about Tim. I, I appreciate so much um, Beth and Tim and, and the work they do to during this time as our search committee is searching out for a, a worship uh, pastor that Tim has said, hey, I'm willing just to step in and then continue to do my other obligations at the church. And we appreciate him greatly for that. Man, this year, it has been a letdown for me. Um, uh, we had the opportunity in June uh, to go to Nepal, and we were so looking forward to that, to see the people there that we love. Many of them watch our, our services, which for them would be Sunday night, uh, late in the evening, but they watch our service and then we were going to leave um, Kathmandu and come back to Istanbul. How many people get an opportunity to go to Istanbul just every day, right? And then as we came back, there was an opportunity, whether we took it or not, we were uh, thinking through it, to go to the Southern Baptist Convention in Orlando, Florida. I mean, there's something about the mouse, you know what I mean? That makes it all the worse wild to go to Orlando. And then listen to this. Um, because of the convention of the Southern Baptists, we were going and been invited uh, to go to Indonesia. And man, we were just go, like, you're kidding. Uh, they wanted us to go to Indonesia and spend some time there looking at the mission work, things that are being done there. And man, we had it all set. And then we were going to come back from Indonesia in July. And in November, uh, in just a few weeks, we would go to uh, Mexico, which we've been going some uh, 25 years, and uh, we were just so looking forward to it and, and to see that relationship and that ministry that we've seen grow over 25 years, and that has been canceled as well. I'm telling you, for us, uh, this year has been a letdown, but I don't want to come across insensitive because I realize my letdown is a drop in the bucket compared to what some people are facing right now, even in our church. During the worship service, I was receiving texts some, from some of our own members that, that have COVID right now, and they were texting me. And so I understand my letdown is nothing compared to what some of our own members are going through. And then when you add to that, over 200,000 Americans have died because of COVID. We know that we are living in uncertain times, like maybe never before. And then you add to this the wildfires that are raging. Listen to this. Since the beginning of the year, four million acres 
have been burned, destroying 9,200 structures. People are without homes today. And then, if we want to add to that again, just come on, add it again, five hurricanes that has touched the United States. I'm telling you, we are living in uncertain times. In their uncertainty about the election right now, I'm sure you have an opinion about the election, who you want to win. Some of you have already voted, but there's uncertainties. It seems like it is so close, they say, and so even that brings uncertainties. What will a new president mean? What will a president that continues his term mean for America? There's uncertainty about the stock market. There are more and more analysts are saying, get ready, there's going to be another crash. It's right around the corner, and there's uncertainties about that. But what about education? Our church is filled with educators, and we wonder what is this going to, how it's going to affect our students in school. What is about uh, their grade level? What about their performance? What about their understanding of what's happening? Are they going to be able to keep the pace? There's also about health care. Um, people are confused. And those in religious circles like myself, we ask, what is it going to look like? What is the church going to look like in the days ahead after we, if we, will we get through this? What will the church really look like? How will it be? In what form will the church take on? And so I want you to understand that, man, you understand just like me that we are living in uncertain times like maybe never before in our lives. And these uncertain times can really wear on you. And they can find a way of affecting your own relationships with the people that you love and your relationships also with yourself facing discouragement, depression. And so we live in uncertain times. Times, But in the midst of that, in the midst of that, John breaks into our world in his first epistle and says, even in these uncertain times in which you and I live in, we need to understand there are certainties that you and I can claim in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we were a little bit Baptocostal this morning, we would say, man, I need that. I need that word that, man, yes, Lord, thank you, that there are some things that I can hang on to and that are no, that are true in these uncertain times. Take your Bible, and we're going to be looking in 1 John, which we have emphasized over and over again this morning. Man, the music was great. The Sunday school lesson was tremendous. And we looked this morning at 1 John chapter 5, 18 through 20. Notice what he says. He begins this way, and he says, We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we might know who is true and who we are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God, eternal life. And if you notice something in our reading, that John loves the word know. He loves that word. Fifteen times in in this little book, he says, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know. Fifteen times John says, listen, as believers, there are certainties that we have that we can claim and hold on to in our lives. Fifteen times he says, we know. One time he says, we may know. So 16 times in this letter, he cries out and he says, you know what? We know. We know. And there are five certainties that I want you to know today out of our reading. Five certainties that I want you to leave here with today and say, you know what? I know this is true. And I can stand on it. 
I can believe it, and I know it's true from God. Even in this uncertain world that we live in, and it is uncertain that you and I, as believers in Christ Jesus, we have certainties that we can claim and hang on to. The first one is this. You can know for certain that sin does not rule over you. I want you to notice in verse 18 what he says. In verse 18, the beginning part, he says, We know that no one is born of God sins. Look at that again. No one that is born of God sins. I'm asking you today in the balcony and in the main floor, if you have sinned this week, just kind of sheepishly raise your hand. If you have sinned this week, just put it up. My new neighbors across the street, man, I know they've sinned. I'm watching them now, and uh, they've moved in. Hey, I want you to know that I can testify that I have sinned this week. Listen, I don't glorify in that, and I don't glory in that, but I can tell you a testimony that I have sinned. So look in verse 18 again. What is John saying? Look at what he's saying. We know that no one who is born of God sins. There are some that interpret this text this way, that we can lose our salvation. Do you know anybody that believes that, that holds that? Arminians believe that. If you hold to an Arminian belief in theology, they believe that you can sin, and when you sin then, you lose your salvation. And man, that, that it would be a hard way to live your Christian life, to believe, for me, I would be, spend more time at times unsaved than I would be saved if I held to that view. And then there's others that believe that we grow, listen, we grow up in Christ, mature in Christ, and we reach a level of sinlessness. We reach a level of perfection when we do not sin. If you hold your place in your Bibles, would you turn back to 1 John Chapter 1, verse 8, for a moment. Chapter 1, verse 8. Notice what it says in chapter 1, verse 8. It says, if we say that we have no sin, uh uh-oh, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. And so for those who believe that somehow that we mature in the Lord to the place that we do not sin, we find that John says, hey, that's not right. Because you're deceiving yourself because we do sin. And so there's a third idea of this. And the third idea is the belief that this should be our goal. This should be our aim in life, that we should set this as our goal, that we do not sin. I would want you to know that that's a good goal to have in life. And that all of us should aspire not to live in sin. Excuse me. But if you say that is what this verse is talking about, if you look at it in the context, it says that no one sins, is born of God, it would then connect sinlessness to salvation. As Dale just sung about earlier, our salvation is not about whether we sin or not sin, our salvation is dependent upon Christ. And so all these ideas that we find here are are really misleading. And so we've got to ask ourselves again, what does this <clears throat> excuse me, verse mean? What is this verse getting at when it says that those who are born of God, listen, those who know that no one born of God sins, what is he talking about? It all revolves around the verb hamartano. It's the verb sin. It, that verb is found in the present tense. And so here's what he's saying. John is saying this, that no one who continues to live in habitual sin, a habit of sin, and just continues in that, is born of God. Now, he's not saying that you and I will not fall into sin, that sin doesn't happen, but he's talking about the one who lives in that habitual sin and just continues to sin over and over and over in his life, 
is not born of God. What he's saying is simply this, that we who have come to Christ, we've been set free from the rule, from the power, from the dominion of sin ruling and living and activating in our lives. He said that's been broken because what Christ has done, that we no longer live in habitual sin. Here's the difference. When you and I sin now, you know what? We don't enjoy it. Christ has taken the fun out of it. Before we were saved, man, we could enjoy it. We could indulge in it. But after we've come to Christ, conviction sets into our life. And it reveals us our sin in our lives. A great, great man, John Newton. We sing his songs often, Amazing Grace that saved a wretch like me. But John Newton, man, he was a wretched man before he came to Christ. His life was filled with indulgence, with prostitutes. His language was awful, a slave trader. He was just a wicked, wicked man. After his salvation, John Newton once wrote these words, and he says, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be, but still, I am not what I used to be, and by the grace of God, I am what I am. And we would say, that's what we're talking about. That's what John is saying. Listen, we're not what we want to be, but we no longer live by the power and the rule and the dominion of sin in our lives. It's been broken. It's been destroyed. And here's what we can know, John is saying, is that sin no longer rules and his dominionship over our life. It's no longer there. It has been broken. And thank God for that. Second, he says, in these uncertain times, we can know this. You can know for certain that Satan is no match for Christ. You know, in our minds sometimes, we can put Satan and Christ on the same level. Sometimes in our minds that we can think that Satan has the same power as Christ, and that when Christ encounters Satan in this world, that Christ, man, he better be at his very best because, you know, Satan's right there with him. But you and I need to understand that Christ rules over Satan, amen? And Christ has the last word over Satan. And he has the last word over Satan according to your life and who you are. For notice what it says in verse uh, 18, the last part. But he who is born of God keeps him. And the evil one does not touch him. In verse 18, twice you see that phrase, born of God. Born of God twice. The first time that is used, you need to make an indication and a note. It's referring to believers. It is saying to you that you have been born of God as a believer. You have been born again. You have been brought into the kingdom of God. It is referring to believers. Now, the second time in verse 18 that phrase, born of God, is used, it is used referring to Christ himself. It is referring to Christ and what he has done. The word born is a verb that is found in the aorist tense, meaning this, punctillary, that there was a time in history that that Christ came. There was a time that Christ intersected our history in life and that he was born in Bethlehem at one time. And Christ was born there, born into our world for what reason? Notice what John says. John says, in order that he might keep you. The word is to guard And so John is saying that Christ, look, was born in order that he could keep you from Satan, guard you. And so the picture that John is describing is this, is that Jesus Christ came, but he's still active and working in our world and what he's doing for you as a believer, that he's guarding you. 
Man, that brings me a lot of joy in my life. To think that Christ himself is guarding, watching over my life. You know, the deists believe that God started this world. He, he set it into motion. And then what did he do? He walked off and just turned his back and said, just let it run. But not John. John said that didn't happen. He says what happens in a believer's life is that Jesus Christ, he guards you. He keeps you. He, he watches over you. For what reason? Notice what he says in the next word. To keep you from being touched by the evil one. The word touch means to take hold of. He's saying this. John is saying, look, Christ is out watching over you in order that Satan never comes and takes your salvation away from him. Man, what you need to write over this verse is what saved always say. Man, I believe it. Do you say amen? He's saying this. Look, man, Christ is not going to allow Satan ever to take you out of Jesus' hands. You cannot lose your salvation. And I'm telling you, in this world that we live in with all these uncertainties, isn't it great to know that you cannot lose your salvation? Now, don't think that Satan's not active in our world. Man, he is active. I'm telling you, watching all the stuff of the political people that are running, man, I can see it in where our nation is going. Those political people that are running for office unashamedly will say, man, I believe in abortion. I believe in the woman's right to murder a child. I believe that, and they say it without shame or regret. Do you realize in the United States, we average 2,362 abortions a day? That's 98 per hour. That's one every 96 seconds. And I'm telling you, we as a church need to stand and make sure that no one gets into office that believes in murdering the innocent life of a child. You need to say hey, amen on that. Man, we know that Satan is working in our world today. We, we see it all around. He's active. He continues to attack the church. He continues to harass believers. But my friend, I want you to know that he can never remove you from the hand of of Christ. John 10, 28, John says it again, and I give them eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Listen, even on your worst days, Satan can't get to your salvation. Even on your best days, Satan can't get to your salvation. And in this world, that I can't promise you what will happen in the next five minutes uh, or tonight, but I can promise you this. My friend, if you've come to Christ, you can know that you know that you know that your salvation is secure in Christ Jesus. And John says, wow, man, you can know it. But there's a third thing that I want you to leave here and know in this world that we live in. The first one is this, is sin has no longer power over your life. The second is, is that your salvation is secure in Christ. But the third thing that you need to know and understand is this. You can know for certain this world lies in Satan's power. Do you see that in verse 19? It says, we know, underline that, we know what? That we are of God. And this whole world lies in the power of Satan. We find this world is now in the control of Satan. Christ has given him that freedom at this time, but that freedom is going to be removed at one time. But he's giving that freedom right now to reign and, and to rule in the world that we live in right now. You see it all around us. You see it in the politics. You see it in governments. You see it also in the religions of the world that Satan is active and alive. But I want you to notice why we should delight. 
we should delight again in verse 18. Go back in verse 18 and notice what it says. It says this, But he who is born of God, he keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. Even though we know that this world is being influenced by Satan, here's what we can rest in. Man, he can't get to me, right? That we are guarded. He cannot touch me. He cannot remove my salvation from me, even though this is happening in the world. Satan has an agenda for the world. And what is it? In John 10:10, 10, 10, it says, the thief, referring to Satan, come only to steal, kill, and destroy. And man, we see that in the lives of people every day. People that have been robbed of their joy. People that have been defeated in their lives. People that uh, commit suicide. We see that, that Satan is working and is alive, but he's not alone. He's not alone in this. We find that the number of angels that were created are innumerable. Uh, without number, we find, it's described in the Bible as a myriad of angels. And it says that Satan took a third of them with him. And there's a, a number of uh, demonic foe that is there. Listen to Ephesians 6, 12. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the powers and against world forces of the darkness and against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Listen again as I emphasize it. He uses the word against rulers, against powers, against world forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness of heavenly places. Most understand this to be ranks. What? He's talking about there's a, a ranking even among the demons. Meaning this, it seems to be that there are certain demons that are like the generals. And they are over maybe continents of the world. And there are the lieutenants that are under them and they are over certain nations of the world. And then under them there are, are certain ones that are over states in the world. And then over cities in the world, over communities, over towns in the world. And so we have this whole host of Satan and his demonic foes that are, are working in the world. And he is ruling. But I, I want you to know and understand this. That even though he is working in the world today, that we as believers, we have the joy of being light in this dark world. We have the joy of punching holes in the darkness by proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ and that there's hope, there's hope, there's light, and it's found in Christ Jesus. John said, I want you to know that in this world right now, presently, Satan is in charge. But it's only for a time. It's only for a time because I'm coming back to the earth and I'm taking it over. And I'm going to show you what it was meant to be as I rule over the earth. But John said there's a fourth thing that I want you to understand and know. He said you can know for certain that God who is true. Look in verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we might know him who it's true. Notice what it says is that he has come, that the Son of God has come. The word is in the present tense, meaning this, that Jesus came to earth, but his ministry here on the earth continues. It's not like he came in Bethlehem and he did his thing on earth and he's gone. No, what John is saying is that Jesus came and he still came. That's not good English, but that's what I'm trying to emphasize. That he came and he still came and he's coming and he's still coming. That he's doing his ministry and it never ends and it, and it continues to go. And John needs to say that you can know him. But here's what John is saying. And we need to be clear on this as a church. You cannot know God unless you know Christ. Listen to what I'm saying. You cannot say, man, I have a relationship with God unless you know Christ. 
Because we hear it all the time. People say, man, I, I worship God. Well, tell me your relationship with Christ. I don't have one with Christ, man. I, I go to God. Listen, my friend, you cannot know the true and the living God unless you know Jesus. Jesus even said it in his own words, didn't he? In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then listen to what he said. Listen, no man, no man, no woman, no student, comes to the Father, but by me, exclusive. And that's why people don't like Christianity. We say, you know what? There's only one way to God. You've got to go to the cross. You've got to go to the cross. He's the only way. But notice what John also emphasizes, and he says, listen, he's the true God. He's the true God. You know, people are searching the world over to find out what is truth. To find out what is true. They're, they're on excursions, and you see them when you travel around the world that, that people are looking for truth. They're looking for answers. They're looking for it in religion. They're looking for it in relationship. They're looking for it in, in some knowledge and what we find. Listen, you can never find God in all that. It'll leave you weary. And the only place that you can find God is when you find Jesus Christ. And my friend John is saying, listen, you can know the true God, the living God, the creator God, that you can know him today, but you can only know him through a relationship with Jesus. But John gives one more. One more, it's the obvious one. But he needed to say it because he's already referred to it earlier, but he comes back to it. And he says, we can know for certain that you have eternal life. That you have eternal life. Man, is there any greater joy in all life is to know that when you lay your head down tonight on the pillow, man, that you can know if something happens, you're going to open your eyes and that you're in heaven. Man, there's no greater joy. Notice how he says that. And he says it in the last part of verse 20. And we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. That is the true God. And notice what he says, eternal life. You know, people all the time are asking the questions. And they said, man, how do I get eternal life? How can eternal life come to me? How do I receive eternal life? But the truth is, listen, that every man, every woman has eternal life. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has put eternity in the hearts of man. And so the question is not that I have eternal life, because everyone has eternal life. It's either life in heaven or it's life in hell. It's life in with a relationship with Jesus Christ or it's a relationship for eternity with Satan. And so all of us have eternal life, but does it matter what eternal life that we're talking about? And we find that John here is talking about eternal life with Christ. Turn back in your Bibles, just a few verses if you would, to 1 John chapter 5. And I want you to notice verse 12. Verse 12. He says, he who has the Son has life. Underline that in your Bible. Listen to today. Do you have the Son? Man, have you received Christ? Have you gone to Calvary and repented of your sin? and ask Christ in your life. Do you have the Son? If you have the Son, then, my friend, listen, you can claim eternal life. Stay right there. Go to the next verse, verse 13. John said, these things I've written unto you. Listen, John said, man, I've written this long letter out to you. Why? In order that what? You may, there's a word again, that you may what? Know that you have eternal life. And so the question is not whether you have eternal life. It's a matter of where you're going to be when you spend eternal life. And John says, listen, you can know that you have life with the Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. You can know it today. Listen, this is what I call not a hope so faith or I wish so faith, but this is a no so faith, amen, that you can know that you know that you know today that, man, you know that you have eternal life. And how do I know that? 
Man, has there ever been a time in your life that you've given yourself to Jesus Christ? Yeah, there has been. Well, listen, my friend, you're going to continue to make mistakes. You're going to continue to stumble and fall, but not based upon what you have done. It's based upon what Christ has done in you. And if he's in your life, my friend, he who has a son has life. And he goes on to say in verse 12, and he who does not have the son does not have life. My friend, listen, you can leave here today with all the certainty of the world that you have eternal life. I can assure you of this. We might get through COVID-19. But what we're not going to get through is this, the uncertainty of life. Man, there's going to be something else. There's going to be something else that comes to your family. There's going to be something else that comes in the world. There's going to be something else that comes against the church. I can assure you this world is not going to get to the place where the uncertainties are, are going to go away. Man, they're only going to get worse. But in a world where uncertainties abound in their every place, John says five things, five things you can be certain of. Five things that you can take to the bank of heaven today. And he says the first one, that sin does not rule your life. And aren't you glad of that? That man, sin doesn't lead you around by a hook in your nose and you're, you're just like a cow going to the slaughter. No, man, Christ, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That sin doesn't rule over your life. And second, Christ will never let you go. You'll never lose your salvation. Man, aren't you glad that when you leave here today and you get in your car, man, Christ is guarding over your salvation. You get in your home, he's guarding you. When you get up in the morning, man, he's there guarding you. He's always there. You will never lose your salvation. And thirdly, this world is ruled by Satan. And John says you need to know that. But you also need to know that one day Christ is coming and he's taking it back. Man, he said, it's mine. I'm taking it back. And Christ will take it back one day. And then you need to know, John is saying, that you can know the true and the living God. Man, what is true? Fake news, fake this, fake that. But my friend, through the word of God, you can know what is true. And then John says the fifth thing that you can claim and know in your life, that you can know, that you know, that you know that you have eternal life. And so my friend, I want to say to you today, lift your head up. Walk with confidence in these uncertain days that there are some things that you can know in this world. Heavenly Father, we praise you today. Man, we praise you, Father, that as we live in these uncertain times, that there are some things that we can know that we know that we know. And we thank you, Father, for these five things that John has spoken of to reassure us and give us hope, give us confidence in this world that we live in. And Father, encourage us today to live with the confidence that is found in you that we can know. And Father, I pray for those that are listening here that, say, that are questioning in their heart, that are frightened and are weary and scared, and they say, you know what, I just don't know. I pray today they will come to the source. They will come to Christ today in order that they might have certainties in this uncertain world. Father, for those that are watching, we pray, Father, they'll call the number right there on the screen, and there'll be somebody there to help them, where they can say, man, I know today. I know today. I know today. And Father, I pray for the body that is here, that you would encourage us, Lift us, strengthen us, that we would live as victors, overcomers in a world faced with so many uncertainties. And we pray this 
In the victorious name of Jesus Christ, amen, amen, amen. Listen, my fellow believer in Christ, man, be encouraged today. Find yourself encouraged that you know certain things that other people don't know. It's not a secret, but they don't know it. It's not real in their lives unless they come to Christ. So be encouraged when you leave here today. And my friend, if you don't know, if you don't know Christ, man, today's the day to know him. We're going to sing an invitation. It's an invitation for us as believers to be strengthened and to renew our faith in Christ. But it's also an invitation that if you don't know him, man, today, unashamedly, come and meet me at the front and just simply say, Pastor, I'm coming to Christ. I want to know that I know that I know that he's my Savior. As we stand and sing, let's sing our hymn of invitation. Have you been to the cross where the Lord Jesus suffered? Have you been to Calvary? Have you been to the place of redemption for sinners have you been to Calvary man you can know today and it was there on Calvary God's your son Lay down his life for you. While there's time, don't delay. Put your faith in Christ Jesus. And turn your eyes now to count. We're going to dis balcony in this side over here. Let's sing it again in faith to the Lord. You can search, you can buy, and try everything man may, but it cannot satisfy. And it is Christ only Christ. 